So, I've asked you which picture shows the correct relationship. What is the correct relationship? Well, it's just that the displacement is the change in position. And so we're looking for the correct vector subtraction. Notice, the delta r vector points from the initial location to the final location, and it should appear in the picture. There's only one option, d, which shows a delta r vector pointing in that direction. So already it looks like it has to be that one. Let's check the other two vectors. So there are the initial and final position vectors, and if we move the final position vector down onto the picture, we see it's there. And the initial position vector needs to be flipped end for end because we need negative delta ri, and then there it is in the diagram. And so d is correct. Let's start to look at a real motion so that we can begin to represent it and then analyze it. So here is me walking at what looks like a steady pace, and then I stop, and then I back up. And that is the whole motion that we're going to look at. In a moment, we're going to see what the motion looks like in a motion diagram straight from the data. But first, I want to just sketch it to illustrate one or two things. So here's what it might look like. It looks like I go across the room at roughly a constant speed. So I'm going to draw it like this. So there, there is me moving at a constant speed. I'm going to put these vectors in that indicate more clearly which way I was going. And I'm going to number these. I stopped here. So I'm going to say this is 5, 6, 7, say. And now I started to back up. But notice that when I back up, the motion diagram runs back over itself. And that gets confusing. So what we do is we just displace it up a little bit. Maybe we'll put same point to show that those two points are not, in fact, different, that I've displaced this for clarity. And then I backed up, going slower than I was going forward. So something like this. And I only go part of the way. That is now a complete conceptual, not necessarily correct to scale, representation of my motion. Now that we've got those ideas of how to draw a motion diagram like this, let's see the real deal. I've taken every tenth frame out of a portion of the middle of the video, and I'm going to use the middle of my head as the marker of where I am, and I'll construct the motion diagram above the frames as I show them. So you see, I go across the room at roughly constant speed. I slow down a little bit, and then at the very end, of course, I slow down to stop. And then I stay there uninterestingly for a few frames, which we'll mostly skip, and then I start back. And I do move more slowly going back, and I don't quite maintain a constant speed, but it's pretty close. And there we go, and it's pretty similar to what I had sketched. To determine my position at any time in the video, we're going to have to do a few things. Of course, we need a reference point, an origin, to measure our positions from. So I'm going to set up some axes. Here are some axes, but we can put the origin anywhere we want. A convenient place to measure from would be the edge of the picture. So I'm going to put my origin there. We also need a way to convert distances in the video frame to distances in real life. Well, I know my height. My height is about 183 centimeters. So here is a stick that I've made that matches my height in the picture, and so that gives us a scale. It'll be different on your computer, but on my screen I can now measure distances, and I can see that this stick corresponds to 11.3 centimeters. So in other words, any distance I measure on my screen, I can now convert because 11.3 centimeters corresponds to 1.83 meters. So I can now measure a distance. So in this frame that we're looking at right now, this distance right here, if I take the middle of my head as the, ref, as the point to which I'm always going to measure, I find that this distance in this frame is 2.0 centimeters on my screen. On your screen, it'll be different. And so I can now get my position here just by doing a conversion. I just convert my 
two centimeters using a standard conversion fraction. So I'm going to put the centimeters in the bottom and the meters in the top and say that my 11.3 centimeter to 1.83 meter conversion fraction gives me a position during this frame of the video of 0.33. No, 0.32 meters. And I'm keeping two sig figs because this measurement only had two sig figs. Now, I don't need to do all this work every time, in fact, because I'm working here in a piece of video analysis software that will automate this all for me. But it's not doing anything fundamentally different from what I just did. The next thing we'd like to be able to do is draw a position versus time graph as another representation of my motion. And so we're going to need to be able to get positions at times. And we can get that now that we have axes and so on. So there's the origin. And so a position vector just points from the origin to me, and I'm still using the middle of my head as the proxy for my location. So there's a position vector. Now, what we're going to graph is going to be technically the x component of the position vector, but for a motion in a straight line like this, that's really not difficult to see. And we'll talk more about components later. So now all we need is the time, and the video analysis software tells us this is frame 355 of the video, and we should be able to use that to determine a time. Let's go one further step in abstraction to get ourselves another way to represent this motion and to be prepared to analyze it. So let's make a position versus time graph. So here's one of the frames out of the video. And the axes are going to be like this for a position versus time graph. So the position is vertical on the graph. And so I'm going to need to flip all these pictures this way so that the direction I'm going is vertical. And then I'm just going to snip them so that I can stack them all like this. And now I want to think about my axes. I had defined x equals 0, the location of my origin, as at the left side of the pictures, which is now the bottom side of the pictures. And I'm just going to, I can make time equal 0 anytime I want, so I'm just going to arbitrarily make the first frame t equals 0. And there we go. Now I just need a scale. And I've already talked about how I can use a calibration using my own height and so on to determine a scale. So there is the position scale. And then the video was shot at 30 frames per second, and we're only looking at every tenth frame here. So every third frame is a second forward. And there is our position versus time graph, except to just abstract it one more step, I'll remove my face and replace it with dots. I just want to stress that what I showed you is not a practical way to make a position versus time graph. That was a lot of work, and of course there are far more efficient ways that we could have got that position versus time data. The reason I really went through this was that this gives you a picture of how to interpret a position versus time graph. It gives you an image of your, in your head of what the graph means. So next lecture we'll go more into how to interpret them, how to use them in analysis.